we must banish from our heads, from our hearts, once and for all, the notion that perhaps God admits us into his kingdom begrudgingly, as though our advocate, Jesus Christ, had found a loophole in the law, done some fancy footwork in the plea bargaining, and squeaked us by the judge. How do we move out from under God's judgment into God's eternal joy? That's the question John Piper answers from Zephaniah 3, 14 to 17 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on September 25th, 1982. Chapter 1. In chapter 1, the prophet announces the judgment that is coming upon Judah and Jerusalem. And you remember last week, in Joel, this was called the day of the Lord. So it is here. Verse 7, be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Verses 14 and 15 use almost identical words to Joel 2.2, 2, where it says, the great day of the Lord is near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. But unlike Joel, Zephaniah lists for us why this judgment is coming upon Judah and Jerusalem. The list is given both in chapter 1 and in chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, where he returns to his concern with Jerusalem. The list begins in chapter 1, verse 4. I will cut off the remnant of Baal. Now, Manasseh, the king that was ruling in Judah just before Josiah, had set up altars and high places to this foreign deity, Baal, even in the temple of Yahweh. Well, when Josiah discovered the book of Deuteronomy and its condemnations of idolatry, he went throughout Judea and tore down the high places, tried to bring the people back to God. But there was a remnant of Baal worshipers left in when Zephaniah comes on the scene and Zephaniah says, that's why the wrath of God is coming upon Israel, namely the idolaters who worship Baal. But you go on to verse 5 and you discover that there are at least two other forms of idolatry in Judah at that time. First, there are those who bow down on roofs to the hosts of heaven. That means sun, moon, and stars. Just like Paul said six centuries later, they gave up the glory of God in order that they might have the glory of a created thing. Then you go on to the last part of verse 5 and you discover another kind of idolater. Those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear to Milcom. Milcom is another name for Moloch, the god of the Ammonites. But remember last week in Joel, we saw that it was God's purpose to show that he alone is God and there is none else. That was the main point, I think, of the book of Joel. Therefore, he said, return to the Lord, worship him with all your heart, not just a piece of it, giving a piece to Milcom and a piece to Yahweh. And if you don't, if you try to serve two masters, give 50 percent or 95 percent of your heart to Yahweh and 50 percent or 5 percent to a foreign God, you will be swept away in the judgment of the day of the Lord. Then if we jump over to chapter 3, where the list of faults and accusations continues, we see that the real problem with the people of Judah is summed up in verse 2 very, very simply. This is Jerusalem being addressed here. Jerusalem listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. So the essence of the sin on which the judgment of the day of the Lord is coming in Jerusalem is self-reliance that has no need for God. They won't listen to anybody. 
They won't accept correction from anybody. They don't need God. They don't trust him. And so they don't draw near to him. So the day of the Lord is coming upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their arrogant refusal to take refuge in the only true God. Now, the second section in chapter two, verses one to three, the prophet summons the people back just like Joel. There may yet be time if you will turn from your evil ways. You may be able to be spared if you will seek the Lord And we shouldn't be surprised in view of what we've seen. The nature of the sin is in chapter one that in verse three, what he calls for in particular is. Seek righteousness, seek humility, he says, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day. Of the wrath of the Lord. Now, I'm not sure why Zephaniah says to the humble of the land that they should seek humility when surely it's the arrogant, self sufficient idolaters who love money who should be told to seek humility. My guess is that what he means is this anyone who is humble enough to submit to the demands of God. Here's what you must do and keep on doing. Stay humble, seek the Lord, and seek righteousness. And and that should sound familiar to you because a very famous song in our day is taken from 2 Chronicles 7.14 where those very three things are sung. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and will pray and seek the Lord and will turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And if that summons applies to the humble of the land, how much more to the arrogant and self-sufficient idolaters and lovers of money? So the main point of Zephaniah's prophecy so far is to call everyone back from pride, from self-determination, from the love of money, from idolatry, to seek deep humility, which frees a person to take refuge in the true God, which results in righteousness. Now, the third section of this book, chapter 2, verses 4 to 15 is introduced by the little word for. Which means very probably that this is going to be a ground or a basis for the command in verse three. He's going to give reasons here why we should seek righteousness and seek humility. And I see three reasons in verses four to 15 of chapter two. First, he warns them that. If they don't seek humility, righteousness and the Lord, there will be no escape in the surrounding countries when the day of the Lord hits. If you turn west, you will find the wrath of the Lord falling on the Philistines in verses four to seven. If you turn to the east, you will find the wrath of God falling on Moab and Ammon. They are famished under the wrath of God. Verses eight to eleven. If you turn south In verse 12, you will find the Ethiopians overcome by the Lord and slain by his sword. And if you turn north, Assyria is wiped out and Nineveh, the great city, is a desolation. In other words, there will be no escape in any direction from Jerusalem when the day of the Lord comes because the wrath of God is falling upon the whole world. That's the first incentive we should have to be serious about the command in verse three. The second way that verses four to 15 motivates us to obey verse three is by promising us that there will, in fact, be a remnant of godly ones in the kingdom. Back in verse three, when it said, perhaps 
you may be hidden on the day of the Lord's wrath. Perhaps. That perhaps doesn't mean that the Lord's righteous deliverance is uncertain. What it means is that in order to be a part of that salvation, we have to be converted through becoming humble and seeking the Lord. And of that, Zephaniah is not certain. But he gives us a tremendous encouragement to be converted, to press on in humility and righteousness when he says that there will be a saved remnant. Verse 7. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah on which they shall pasture. Verse nine, the remnant of my people shall plunder them and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. There are going to be saved people. Now, do you see the implication of that promise How can God be sure that if salvation depends upon our conversion to humility and righteousness and trust in the Lord, that in fact there will be people who survive the day of the Lord and come to salvation? The scripture teaches that the reason he can be certain is that he performs the conversion and sees them through. Several decades later, when the people are beleaguered in Babylon, the prophet Ezekiel rises. He confronts the people with this wonderful word of comfort, and it gives the answer to Zephaniah's question. It says in Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. God can require conversion and obedience for salvation and turn around and say there will be a remnant saved for sure because he's going to perform the conversion, put his spirit in their hearts and see them through the day of the Lord to glory. And that should be a tremendous encouragement to us To know we are not left to ourselves when we hear the command, seek righteousness, seek humility, seek the Lord. For now we know that when we begin to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, God Almighty is at work within us to will and to do his good pleasure. And that is a great incentive to get on with the business of verse 3. And finally, the third reason why we should obey verse 3 that's given in verses 4 to 15 of chapter 2 is that in this section, Zephaniah shows that the reason these surrounding nations are going to be judged is because of their pride. And the command of verse 3 is for humility. Verse 8 I have heard the taunts of Moab and the revilings of the Ammonites, how they have taunted my people and made boasts against this, their territory. Verse 10, this shall be their lot in return for their pride because they scoffed and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. Verse 15, Nineveh, the great capital of Assyria, This is the exultant city that dwelt secure and said, I am and there is none else. What a desolation she has become. Now, if you're listening to the prophet Zephaniah, as you I hope you are right now, how can you but help to feel strong incentive to surge forward in your obedience of verse three? Seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek above all humility. When we know that it's for pride that his judgment is coming upon the world. Now, the third section of the book of Zephaniah is chapter three, verses eight through 20. And here the prophet Zephaniah describes for us the future glories of the godly. He turns now from warnings and threats to promises and good news 
for those who will, in fact, humble themselves and seek the Lord. The first thing I want you to notice here is that even though those promises are most directly applied to the nation Israel, and I really think that means Israel, nevertheless, the necessary implication of the prophecy is that the blessings are going to overflow the banks of Israel and extend to the world, even to Minneapolis. Notice verse 9. Yea, at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples. That's not Israel, that's peoples beyond. To a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. That's us. We're included in these blessings here to use Paul's explanation through faith in Christ, who is the seed of Abraham. We become seed of Abraham heirs according to the promise. So when you read this great third chapter, don't say, oh, that sure is great for Israel. I wish I could be included. You're included if you're in Christ the seed of Abraham. Now, what is it that's going to characterize all the people, Gentiles and Jews, as they gather before the Lord on this last day? Verses 11 to 13, and you'll notice, I think, that this confirms our understanding that verse 3 of chapter 2 is the main point of the book. Look what these people look like. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst the proudly exultant ones. And you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. For I will leave in the midst of you a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no wrong. And utter no lies. So, humility, that root opening of the heart to be directed by God. Humility, taking refuge in God, or as we would say today, taking refuge in Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Humility is not only the way of escape from divine wrath. It is the way of entrance into divine joy. So let's look at that joy in conclusion. Verse 14. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. That's what the humble are going to be doing for all eternity. And verses 15 to 20 of chapter 3 list the reasons why they're going to be so happy forever and ever. Let me mention four of them and just focus on the fourth one verse 15 the judgment that had been directed against you is taken away Two, all the enemies all those opponents of your happiness all those hindrances to your joy are cast out third the lord the king of israel is in your midst a mighty warrior strong to save There is no more fear anymore. And finally, and this is the one I want to focus on, verse 17. The Lord will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. Or a better translation would probably be he is silent in his love, which means he's not going to bring up any accusations. And he will exult over you with loud singing or with a shout of joy. You remember that Jesus said there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety nine people who need no repentance. And Zephaniah goes on to say, and when those people, the humble, repentant, Lowly sinners gather before God. What will he do? Will he look down with disapproval and glower at their guilt 
looked and look askance with malevolence at their evil? Will he ignore them and in a sublime indifference just look out over them in his sovereignty? Will he look down with grief upon how shabby his people are? No. The text says he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will exult over you with a shout of joy. If you can imagine what it will be like for God to shout. As a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, Isaiah says, so shall your God rejoice over you. We must banish from our heads and from our hearts once and for all the notion that perhaps God admits us into his kingdom begrudgingly, as though our advocate, Jesus Christ, had found a loophole in the law, done some fancy footwork in the plea bargaining, and squeaked us by the judge. On the contrary, God himself put Jesus Christ forward as a substitutionary atonement for our redemption. And when we're redeemed in him, God welcomes us with bells on. He puts a ring on our finger, a big robe around us, kills the fatted calf, throws the party, and leads us in the festal dance forever and ever. And someone might say, oh, but isn't that a bit unseemly and undignified of God to go Skipping and jumping and leaping before his hosts. And my answer is, remember David's wife, Michael. When David, before the ark of the Lord, came into Jerusalem, he danced with all his might. And Michael looked out of her window and despised him for that immoderate display of emotion. And the Lord struck her barren for the rest of her days, for he wills to be mightily enjoyed. And one of these days he's going to show us how first class. And then finally, someone else might say, but doesn't it belittle God? To rejoice over us? I mean, shouldn't we be rejoicing over him? Doesn't that get things topsy-turvy? And my answer is, not necessarily. It would be unrighteous if we became God's God. It would be unrighteous if his joy had its ultimate spring in us and not in himself. But that's not the case here. We are not the God of our God. Rather, when we stand before him, you know what he's going to see? He's going to see his own handiwork. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Christ. Jesus. And according to chapter 3, verse 12, it is God himself who is going to see to it that there is in the midst of Zion a humble and lowly people who take refuge in his name. Does it belittle the designer of the IDS Tower to stand out there on 8th Street at dawn on September and exult in the beauty of that building? Does it belittle Michelangelo to stand with tears of joy as he looks up to the Sistine Chapel roof? Nor does it belittle God when the divine work of redemption is finished and the redeemed in Jesus Christ stand before him millions upon millions, the lowly, and the humble, and God lifts his hands and shouts with joy over the victory that he has achieved over Satan and sin and the world. And therefore, while the day of the Lord waits, 
Seek the Lord. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Rejoice and exult with joy, O daughter of Zion. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 11-part series, God's Voice in the Minor Prophets, with a sermon titled, Preparing to Meet God. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.